profound. And this morning we have Dr. Michael Liepman, who's going to be talking about active surveillance for prostate cancer, stepping out into the real world. Okay, thank you, Dan. Good morning, everyone. And thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, and so today, you know, I'm going to talk about active surveillance for prostate cancer, but I'm going to attempt to discuss this in sort of a bit of a different lens. Um, of course, talking about the rationale behind active surveillance for prostate cancer, the evidence, uh, evidence and support of the long-term safety and durability of the approach. But I also want to talk about, um, really, really think about active surveillance and what happens when it's implemented in the real world and look really at the lens of observational data. Um, with a specific uh, emphasis on the methods and the research met methods um, for looking at real-world data. And so just by way of disclosures, I have no relevant disclosures. I am going to be speaking about some commercially available genomic tests and other proprietary um, things, but I have no relevant disclosures. So the outline for today, I'm going to first begin talking about the rationale for active monitoring of low-risk prostate cancer go into the evidence. Um, and I really want to talk about how and how and why we can generalize certain pieces of evidence that come from academic cohorts when we're trying to implement them in less than ideal conditions. Um, and third, focus on what we can learn from ob observational studies um, applied to active surveillance for prostate cancer. Um, and then talk about some of our work looking at the real world adoption of new prognostic um, and, and predictive technologies, um, they're both their utilization and their effectiveness in facilitating active surveillance. So um, I think this is a familiar slide looking at the incidence uh, and mortality associated with prostate cancer in 2020. It's estimated that there will be over 190,000 new ca diagnosed cases of prostate cancer. We clearly don't know how that will be affected by the coronavirus pandemic. Um, I assume that will lead to fewer diagnosed cases of prostate cancer, um, which lends itself to its, to its own relevant questions about the, uh, the consequences of, of delayed diagnosis. But it's estimated that there will be over 30,000 deaths as well. So even though, um, so that ratio between incidence and mortality is also very telling. Um, the, the vast majority of patients who are diagnosed with prostate cancer will succumb to other causes. Um, indicating that the majority of what we diagnose through screening and early detection um, is not necessarily lethal. Um, this data from the World Health Organization uh, is looking at the, um, the variation in prostate cancer mortality. And I think it's important to emphasize that prostate cancer is a highly regionalized disease. Um, and that's something I really, uh, a theme that I'm gonna return to this morning again and again. And so, the, although prostate cancer, we are clearly focused on, on our part of the world, um, the burden uh, from the disease really varies tremendously, um, particularly hardest hit in sub-Saharan Africa. There are air, you know, regions in, in Asia where the, uh, the burden from prostate cancer mortality um, is significantly lower. We also see patterns of regionalization within our own, uh, within our own country. This is data um, looking at the county level. And we have, you know, sustained hotspots of increased prostate cancer mortality uh, in the southeast United States. Um, and where we are, we're actually sort of in a better, uh, a better part of the world in terms of aggregate um, prostate cancer mortality. We can also look at improvements in prostate cancer mortality. These are trends over time, looking at the percentage change in the age standardized mortality between 1980 and 2014. And so we would. So when we when we think about implementing or rolling out a, a public health initiative like screening early detection, um, we really apply this to a homogenous uh, country, the United States. But the reality is that there are tremendous differences that occur at the zip code level and really the household level. Um, and um, this question of regional variation in care and regional variation in outcome. Uh, is clearly very interesting and, and sort of one of the tools that we have used to look uh, at the adoption of these technologies. Um, and so if we think about really how, how this all came about, you know, this all really begins with the PSA story. And this is a slide which I know um, we've all seen before, looking at um, the impact of prostate cancer screening uh, 
um, seen in contrast to the effects of the widespread implementation of mammography. Um, and what we're plotting here is the incidence of metastatic prostate cancer um, in relation to, to when, we started, uh, the, when we started screening with PSA. So there's been a dramatic decline in the risk of um, metastatic disease and death from prostate cancer, which is wholly attributable to the use of PSA testing. And so from the perspective of a biomarker, PSA is really wildly successful, and probably the best biomarker that we can think about uh, in the field of oncology um, in, terms of its, uh, in terms of its goal of reducing cancer mortality. However, it's, it's clear that this comes at a cost um, and the cost is over detection. And so in the pre-PSA era, uh, essentially most, of the most or all of the disease that was detected was symptomatic at presentation. And we saw this uh, clear spike in the early 90s reflecting um, um, widespread early diagnosis, including low-grade low disease. Um, and for decades, you know, there was reflexive treatment of all incident prostate cancer for the most part. Um, and I think sort of the, the inflection point happened in 2012 when the uh, U.S. Preventive Service Task Force issued its grade D recommendation um, urging or suggesting that we do not screen routinely for prostate cancer due to the harms related to screening and, and diagnostic procedures, as well as the harms related to the treatment of detected cancer. Uh, and so the message is clear that, um, that rates of uh, that universal treatment for prostate cancer and the associated harms um, uh, threaten the viability of screening in general. Um, and as a consequence, we began seeing declines uh, in both screening and diagnosis of prostate cancer with a relative decrease in screening of 10% between 2005 to 2008 uh, eight, and 18% between 2010 and 2013. Um, and these numbers are continuing to evolve. So fundamentally, the problem was that detection was linked to treatment, and there was no daylight between these two, uh, between these two elements here. Um, and so, you know, basically, the, the solution appears to be uncoupling detection from treatment. Um, and this al allows us to preserve the um, ability of early detection and PSA, and PSA screening to identify um, uh, potentially lethal prostate cancers and, and deliver treatment to those patients while not treating all, all men with prostate cancer. And so the question is, who is a candidate for active surveillance? This is data that we're all, uh, data and, and clinical guidance that we're all very comfortable with, but, but patients who with, who've had an extended pattern biopsy, um, and in this era, probably MRI guided, showing low grade disease without pattern four or five. Pa patients should also have low volume disease, less than 50% of a single core, or less than 33% of total cores positive. And these are, tend to be the strictest criteria for who is a candidate for active surveillance. In reality, um, the, the recommendations have really broadened to virtually all patients with Gleason pattern six or prognostic grade group one appear to be good candidates for initial, um, initial surveillance. PSA uh, and other biomarkers appear to have a role. Um, also, PSA density is a good predictor of um, of having high grade or non-localized uh, non prostate cancer. So a PSA density of less than 0 0.15 is considered to be favorable. Um, patients also have to be able to attend frequent follow-up and be reliable. Um, and this also comes into the question of who is a good candidate. Um, age, race, ethnicity are also spoken about frequently. Um, I believe there's also been an inversion in thinking about the role of race, ethnicity uh, in prostate cancer. Uh, data from Hopkins looked at the risk of upgrading and upstaging in African-American patients, um, which initially sort of sounded the alarm, um, implying that, um, that African-American patients are at higher risk for developing um, or, or for having um, adverse outcomes on surveillance and should, and should be cautioned against it. And I think a lot of, and, and many studies, including some of our own, have questioned that um, um, and, and suggest that active surveillance is a safe and viable initial approach for all patients. Um, and increasingly, we are in the era of MRI and genomics, which we'll return to later. So we do have this overall picture of who's a candidate for initial surveillance, uh, driven by uh, overall clinical risk stratification, Gleason grade, clinical stage, uh, PSA as the primary drivers. And so, you know, so what are the outcomes? 
Um, and I, I really am showing this data to highlight where this information is coming from. Um, and what they all share in common are these are carefully curated institutional cohorts of patients um, who really are under the best possible circumstances. This is data from Toronto, from, uh, from Lori Klotz, really considered the, you know, one of the, the, you know, the, the fathers of active surveillance. And so, um, you know, these are, like I said, the best possible um, implementation of active surveillance. These patients are self-selective and monitored very carefully. Um, uh, and, and, and in this group, and this is data from 2015, looking at 819 um, patients with prostate cancer followed for a median of 6.4 years, and only a 1.5% uh, uh, risk of death from prostate cancer, uh, including a cohort that's enriched for higher grade uh, patients. Data from Hopkins also shows a very favorable trend, 26% reclassified at 10 years, 50% at 10 years. And data from UCSF showing a similar trend, 100% prostate cancer specific survival and 98% over, overall survival. And what all these studies seem to share is that, you know, first of all, the, the median follow-up on all of these studies rarely exceeds 10 years, partially because of the novelty of the, of the approach. And these are also, also carefully um, selected patients, as, as I said, enriched for better socioeconomic status, um, interest and willingness to attend follow-up, um, and low attrition. Um, so the question you know, becomes how generalizable is that and can we see that uh, everywhere? This is data from, uh, the, from the Prius trial, which is a European uh, randomized trial of prostate cancer, also showing um, uh, treatment-free survival, showing that approximately 70% remain free from treatment by five years. Um, again, showing that the durability of active surveillance is good, but the outcomes have been um, relatively uh, limited to the short term. And then we had data from PROTECT, um, which really I think was a, a watershed moment for the safety and, and viability of active surveillance. And this was a randomized trial of over 1,500 patients uh, in the UK at over 40 sites. And patients were randomized in even fashion to surgery, radiotherapy, or active monitoring for prostate cancer. And it's really quite rare, rare in oncology when you see lines which are totally flat and there's no, really no discernible difference here. Uh, and that's because the, the cancer-specific survival and overall survival is approximately 100% in all group, no matter what you did. However, the long-term outcomes looking at disease progression begin to tell a bit of a different story where there were differences in the risk of disease progression uh, among the patients initially randomized to active surveillance. Um, and I think that tells us uh, you know, a lot about the, the need to to risk stratify appropriately at initial diagnosis um, um, and, and quickly take patients uh, for curative local therapy should they have more aggressive features. Um, and you know, it's worth saying that, that the, the context for the study is, you know, this was initiated in the early 90s when the, the manner in which we surveilled for prostate cancer was relatively limited. Patients were not clearly having MRI studies or routine biopsies and they were essentially uh, followed by PSA and digital rectal examination alone. You know, and so for, this was published in the New England Journal in 2016, you know, it had really the, the stamp of approval um, and prostate and active surveillance has been sort of unquestionably advanced in clinical care guidelines. And so the question is, can I just stop this talk here? Is this enough to say, you know, that the ink is dry on this? Is this all we need to know? Um, and you know, the answer is probably no, because I think we know from many other analogous malignancies that once we have level one evidence, there's still a need to understand how things are implemented in the real world, especially if we're proposing that this uh, approach be applied to hundreds of thousands and millions of individuals diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, and that's especially relevant because active surveillance is now really considered the standard of care. It is recommended for most men with low grade prostate cancer. Um, as the recommended management strategy. Um, and this has really been um, seen in, in all clinical care guidelines uh, in oncology. But I wanna begin advancing the, the thought that there may be some differences in the real world. Um, and these are some of the potential problems, the, the potential realities on the ground. And I think those really relate to three different uh, categories. 
One is differences in representation um, that we have to ensure that the patients that we're seeing in front of us in the clinic actually look like and are, diff are, are similar or analogous to the patients who are highly represented in the institutional cohorts uh, and the randomized trials, which have supported the safety of actor surveillance. The second question is durability. Um, and I showed, I, you know, I presented the data looking at the, um, the length of follow-up in these studies. And so when we have an individual in front of us, we're not worried about their five-year outcome. We see someone and we need to, to sort of um, be confident that the, the approach that we initially recommend is gonna be durable for, the, for, for their entire life. Um, and if we expose, you know, if, if we defer treatment, um, some certainty about whether or not that will have an effect um, later on. And lastly, the question is reproducibility. I mentioned cohort, careful cohort selection um, in some of the other trials. So we don't, don't always have the luxury of handpicking patients who are either self-selected to come see us, um, but under, have to understand how data can be generalized and reproduced for all patients. So already, you know, the, the, the cart, have, the, the horse has left the station. Um, this is recent data from JAMA published last year, um, looking at the utilization of actor surveillance in, um, in SEER. This is um, showing us that actor surveillance has eclipsed radical prostatectomy and radiation therapy for patients with low-grade prostate cancer. Um, because of the, the natural lag time between SEER data, um, um, there's, there's sort of a built-in four to five year difference in um, lag time in reporting. So that's why it ends in 2015, but already we see this trajectory continuing to increase and expect it to increase further. But we also know that, that whether or not a patient is managed with active surveillance uh, really varies on the, on the individual level. It varies at the level of who they happen to see as a doctor and who that patient is. Um, and this is a very elegant study from Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt looking at urologist level correlation of urology, urologist level individual correlates of having their patients managed with active surveillance. And this is data from SEER Medicare that examined variation in the use of active surveillance um, between 2004 and 2009. So in each risk stratum, and this goes by low, intermediate, and high, um, you know, they performed a multivariable mixed effects model that was fit to characterize associations between observation um, and selected patient characteristics. Um, and from these models, it was estimated, the, they estimated the probability of observation at each, for each urologist with, um, and the association between the physician level estimated rates of observation um, for low risk and high risk disease. And so what these are called caterpillar plots um, of the urologist level variation in the use of active surveillance. Um, and these confidence intervals show um, urologists whose 95% confidence interval excludes the mean. Um, and so showing that they are, they are either higher or lower than the mean. And this shows really the wide variation that you can see um, based, between, based on simply who the doctor is, okay? Um, um, and in this scatter plot, we, this, this scatter plot here shows individual urologist differences from the mean estimated probability of observation relative to the mean. Um, for both low and high risk prostate cancer. Um, and so you can see this black line here um, demonstrates the urologist level correlation between the estimated probability of observation for low and high risk prostate cancer. And this blue line here uh, represents the sensitivity analysis of prostate cancer experts. And those were defined as urologists who really saw a higher volume of patients greater than 10 low and high risk patients um, each year. And so really this demonstrates that there, are, there is considerable urologist level variation in the use of observation for low risk prostate cancer, but more important that the use of observation for low risk prostate cancer and high risk prostate cancer um, is correlated at the urologist level. So we know that use is variable. We know that the individual preferences of physicians and patients varies. Um, and you know, given um, mounting questions and skepticism about the um, uh, about about the initial approach over you know decades ago, uh, there's been a long interest in improving risk stratification, um, and I think these are also tools which are very familiar to us. And I'm not really going to speak about the specifics of how each of them work or their individual validation, 
um, based on based on our time constraint. But I, I think it's fair to summarize that both prostate MRI and genomic testing have rapidly come on the scene as tools that can improve initial staging um, and prognostic estimates in prostate cancer. That benefit appears to be most pronounced for prostate MRI in terms of staging prostate cancer um, and for genomic tests for offering prognostic estimates. And so by stage, we mean, is the cancer localized to the prostate? Um, is, it a, is there extra capsular extension? Is there a visible lesion? Um, whereas genomic testing also offers very, very similar estimates, such as questions of adverse pathology, such as stage three disease, nodal disease, um, but can all also offer prognostic, prognostic estimates of the risk of progression um, uh, over time. So both of these both of these technologies, I think we can sort of, for the purposes today, think of them as tools um, or a prism that we can shine information through. And so, you know, historically the paradigm has been a prostate for a prostate cancer diagnosis um, and a decision. And I think that these new these new tools aim to sort of um, disperse a spectrum of light and take take these decisions in different directions. And this is an analogy that I have returned to again and again. And so the you know the promise is that that these new tools will help identify some patients who need to be treated and some patients who can be safely surveilled. And I think that's really the, um, that's the, at least the model that, that, that they have tried to convey. Um, but there are questions that clearly arise, such as how have these tools become integrated into real world practice? Um, has their uh, utilization been uh, equal or, or are there disparities in access and utilization? as well as does adoption of new expensive technologies lead to better decisions? And I think that's really the, that's really the, the main point we wanna sink our teeth into is, does using, does using these technologies actually culminate uh, in more extra surveillance if we think that's appropriate or more treatment if we think that's appropriate? How can we make sense of that data? So I wanna talk about some of our, our studies that we've done here looking at the national adoption of gen both genomic testing and prostate MRI. Um, and this is a, a, a co what's called a dynamic cohort study that we performed using data from Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, which is the largest commercial insurer in the United States, representing over 100 million lives. And we looked at the utilization of, of both prostate MRI and genomic testing at the hospital referral region. And I want to talk a little bit about what that is and what these hospital referral regions are, and this is a term I'll be returning to, are regional healthcare markets for tertiary medical care. Um, and these were um, geographic boundaries that were defined by the Dartmouth group that looked at rates of complex surgical intervention um, and patterns of, of complex surgical in, uh, interventions, such as cardiac catheterization and neurosurgery, um, but what has been applied to prostate cancer and other malignancies. Um, and this is one, one plot showing the differences at hospital referral region uh, of the incidence of prostate cancer, for example. Um, and showing clear market variation um, at the regional level in terms of how much prostate cancer is diagnosed, how much is treated, and the patterns of care within each level. So in this study, we included men who were age 40 to 89 who were newly diagnosed with prostate cancer and identified them by diagnosis code. Uh, we identified claims for risk assessment technologies by CPT code um, for genomic tests and for, for prostate MRI is pelvic MRI between 2012 and 2018, and looked at temporal uh, and regional trends in testing at the HRR level. So not at the individual level, but at the regional level, um, um, and identified over 92,000 patients who met criteria uh, for evaluation. So I wanna talk about some of the statistical analysis that we did. Some of the modeling is kind of interesting. Um, and the first thing we did is looked at trends in testing at the HRR level. Um, but applied a technique called group-based trajectory modeling to identify strata of distinct regions adopting each technology. And the idea was to understand and convey developmental trajectories, um, sort of under the, under the understanding that there may be regionally sim similar phenotypes of adoption that differ in geographically different areas. Um, there could be certain conditions at the local level which are shared even across different states and also look at factors associated with the adoption of testing, um, looking at contextual factors from the Dartmouth Atlas at the HRR level, such as the intensity of prostate cancer screening within a region, how many providers are in that region, income, education level, 
and other questions um, and compare those differences across strata identified through our group-based modeling. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that is. And so what group-based trajectory modeling is, it's, it's sort of a branch of what we call finite mixture modeling. Um, and kind of the basic idea is that populations are often divided into groups or subpopulations. We can we think of these commonly, age groups, income brackets, levels of education, what have you. Um, so regression models uh, or distributions are likely to differ uh, when we do that across these groups. Um, but sometimes we don't have a variable that, that identifies these groups. Um, and it could be that that group is missing, that variable is missing. Maybe it's hard to collect, such as honest reporting of biases, preferences, sexual function, what have you. Or maybe it's inherently not observable. Um, maybe there are differences in, in, the, in the propensity for, for risk or uncertainty. So in these cases, uh, we can use what's called, we can use finite mixture modeling to model the probability of belonging to each of the unobserved groups and estimate the distinct parameters of a regression model or distribution in each group. And then use that to classify individuals into the groups or draw inferences about how these groups behave. Um, and so I won't go too much into exactly how it's done, but um, this really sums across a finite number of groups that, com that comprise the study population. And when we say mixture, that refers to the fact that the population is composed of a mixture of unobserved groups. We don't know everything about the population. And so we express, we can sort of make sense of the different trends about what's happening by looking at the probability of, of and this model looks at the, prob of the probability of belonging to a certain group and the probability of an outcome if a patient belongs, if a region belongs to a specific group. Um, and that outcome here is, is receiving genomic testing. So here's our data when we looked at each hospital referral region. Uh, and these colors represent the uh, proportion of patients who received a genomic test, I'm sorry, initially who, who received a prostate MRI um, in 2012 to 2018. I'm gonna start with MRI first um, and show that there was overall uh, really sharp increases, but it was quite variable with some regions adopting, not adopting prostate MRI at all. And in some, the, the majority of patients were receiving testing. Um, and so I, I'm, this is, I'm gonna start with the MRI data first. And so you can also see this mapped out on the, um, on the de by decile. And so you can see that the highest adopting regions here versus the lowest adopting regions um, by decile. Um, and so this, is, this data looks at to the, the trajectories of MRI adoption in 2012 to 2018 um, and shows us that you can actually make sense of a few different patterns. And so these are the results of the group-based modeling. Um, and so here, the, the groups basically fall into four different categories. And we spend some time fitting how each of these categories work. Um, but, um, uh, but there appear to be four what we call latent strata, four observable patterns. And one are groups that began using MRI, and I'm gonna show you the genomic testing data afterwards, but that began using MRI um, well, you know, at baseline and continued to increase. Um, there are lower levels, which had very little use in the beginning, but increased almost at the same rate of the high group. Um, there are regions which had very little use, increased somewhat, but not very much. And interestingly, a group of, of stable or, or if not declining use of prostate MRI. Um, and then we characterized the strata of, or the characteristics uh, that were associated with more, um, more rapidly adopting prostate MRI. And so, re so clusters of regions that were the, the fastest expanders of MRI had higher levels of college education, higher median income, higher baseline rates of observation for prostate cancer, lower rates of surgery per thousand patients, um, but there were interestingly no differences by race, provider density, baseline use of PSA testing, radiation therapy, or prostate cancer incidence. And this is our, uh, these are the findings from genomic testing, which I think are also quite interesting because for genomic testing, you're starting with almost zero use at baseline across the board. There was some implementation of prostate MRI in 2012, but there was nothing in, no, no genomic testing in 2012 because these tests were not really implemented until uh, 2014. So overall, the, the usage of, of genomic testing increased from about 0.8% to 11.3%, the, by the end of 2018. 
These are the strata of adoption of genomic testing. Like I said, essentially starting from zero in 2012 with clear outliers of both highly interested regions where, the, where probably the majority of low risk patients are being tested um, and many regions where there was minimal uh, growth or adoption of testing. And these are the four different phenotypes of adoption of genomic testing that emerged. And so they all started from, from, from zero, um, but there, there was really a strong outlier of, of hospital referral regions. And interestingly, the, the highest utilizer of genomic testing in the United States uh, is a small hospital referral region in North Dakota, where virtually everyone receives genomic testing, regardless of risk strata. So we similarly looked at differences in adoption at the regional level to help understand what, what conditions may facilitate or, or be associated with the, with the early and, and um, rapid adoption of genomic testing. Um, so clearly we see a similar signal here in terms of uh, median home income, uh, 58,000 versus 50,000, um, higher education levels, higher, uh, higher percentage of patients who, uh, with, who have a college degree, a higher prostate cancer incidence or regions that are, that are doing more prostate cancer screening, detection and treatment, were also more likely to utilize genomic testing, um, but did not see differences by race, provider density, um, or, other, or other features. And then sort of the interesting question is, well, how do these overlap? Are patients simply getting both? Um, and it's actually interesting is that, that there really appear to be uh, sort of two different, two different patterns. There are regions which adopt genomic testing, the regions which adopt prostate MRI, um, but, but they're, not, they're not highly correlated. So the VAST received one or the other, but not both, um, uh, which is an interesting finding. So, um, you know, the question of the, of the equity of, uh, or the equity with which these technologies are, um, are disseminated is also interesting. Um, and this is um, data shifting gears a little bit from SEER Medicare looking at the Medicare population um, where we found that non-white race was associated with 34% lower adjusted odds of receiving a prostate MRI. Um, and so this is a, a really a persistent difference which we have observed, um, including in the most recent um, SEER Medicare linkage. So there continues to be even adjusting for socioeconomic status, region, insurance status, a persistent difference in the use of prostate MRI um, for African American and, and black patients, um, which really has not been well understood and clearly requires uh, uh, additional additional investigation. So, you know, some of the take home points from this, um, you know, fr from the question about adoption or, or that, that adoption of prostate MRI and genomic testing has been highly variable at the regional level, um, but there are shared phenotypes of adoption that are seen across ge geographically diverse regions. And those conditions seem to reflect socioeconomic status uh, and education level. Um, there are concerns for disparity in access, even among insured patients and when controlling for location. So all of this data that I've presented, these are all insured patients, either through Medicare or Blue Cross Blue Shield, but there are still marked disparities um, in, in the receipt of these technologies uh, and the follow-up uh, management for these patients. So I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about the question, uh, the, the final question, which is really the, the real world effectiveness of these new technologies. And so, you know, the question is where does the rubber hit the road? Are these tools meeting their intended goal, which is to facilitate um, or um, facilitate decision-making and, and very likely move patients more in the direction of active surveillance rather than definitive treatment. So I, I wanna start with this data, which is sort of industry-sponsored data um, from Genomic Health who, who make the Oncotype DX assay. Um, and this has sort of been used for regulatory approval because these post-marketing studies are sort of a requirement for continued payment um, and justify, justify their, what's their quote-unquote utility. Um, and this is sort of retrospective data that, that, the, that they've collected, um, you know, looking at the proportion of patients who actually were monitored, who, who received active surveillance based on whether or not they had um, a, a genomic test. And basically what they show is that genomic testing was associated with more, uh, with a higher, uh, a higher likelihood of, of being managed with active surveillance. Um, and so even though this data didn't really make a splash, it's sort of intentionally buried um, in order to get sort of post, continued post-marketing approval. Um, but it really asks the question of, are these technologies, are genomic testing and MRI 
facilitating or continued, continuing to be associated with adoption of, of active surveillance. And so this is actually sort of a, an interesting uh, problem, an interesting nut to crack, because you know, if you ask the question sort of in a, in a conventional observational research way, you know, is this testing associated with this outcome, right? Sort of a simple idea to think about. Is getting a prostate MRI, is getting genomic testing associated with a greater odds, a greater probability of being, uh, of, ha of having a, uh, active surveillance? That's a little tricky. So if we think about going back to our framework, this is our, our patient we, who we begin with over here. They receive some form of testing and they have an outcome, either surgery or no surgery, radiation or no radiation. Um, things are really not always so clear. You know, in reality, it's not so simple. We have problems of reverse causality. Are patients receiving these tests because they're planned to have surgery, um, uh, which is probably one of, the, one of the biggest concerns. Are there omitted variables? Are there, are there, inst are there questions which we're not thinking about? Um, which affect all of these is socioeconomic status driving the use of active surveillance and driving the use of genomic testing. Um, and so um, thinking about this sort of um, just as a, a linear pathway is, is probably uh, far too simple. So, um, and so what, what, what we did here is looked at a geographic analysis, and this is really almost an ecological study where we looked at the HRR region. Um, and so, uh, we're returning to that question of these geographic regions, which already clearly show variation um, in the implementation of MRI and genomic testing, and decided to ask the question that way. Are regions which adopted MRI or genomic testing, um, did they see greater changes in the rate of observation for prostate cancer over time? And so, so we did this analysis two different ways. And one is looking at, you know, still at the geographic uh, regional level, um, examining whether increases in an HRR's use of genomic testing was associated or MRI was associated with greater change in the rate of, uh, of active surveillance. And so um, when adjusting for local, con local conditions, uh, historic, historical rates of observation for prostate cancer, demographic considerations, the, the percentage increase uh, in an HRR's use of genomic testing was interestingly not associated with change in observation for prostate cancer. However, percentage increases in, in the use of MRI was associated with a 0.3% increase in the use of observation um, at the HRR level, um, which is sort of interesting. And so that was the initial analysis. And we also did um, uh, sensitivity analysis using what's called an in instrumental variable um, approach, which is um, kind of an interesting approach. So if we think about sort of, the, you know, that, that prior framework where we have an exposure variable and an outcome that we want to study, um, very often we have a confounding variable, something which masks or, um, or, or muddles the true relationship between X and Y here. Um, and, and we can call that U, be, be that confounding variable. And so um, we, we can do what's called, a, we can look for the validity of something which, which is called an instrument. And an instrumental, an instrumental variable um, are used to control for confounding and measurement error uh, in observational studies and sort of allow for the possibility of making causal inferences in observational data, because that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to assign some causality to the use of these technologies uh, and see if they are actually leading um, leading to that outcome. And so, you know, let's say we have these two correlated variables that we want to regress, X and Y, sort of looking at that classic relationship between the two. Um, we can describe their relationship based on this third variable, Z, um, that's associated with X. It's associated with the exposure variable but and associated with the outcome, but only through its relationship with X. Um, and so kind of, you know, that can be a little complicated to think about, but think about a, sort of an example um, if we wanted to investigate the link between depression, X, and smoking, um, uh, you know, one example which is commonly used is sort of the lack of job opportunities. Z could be an instrument to, um, to that could lead to depression, um, but it's only associated with smoking through its association with depression, meaning being a, um, that there's no direct uh, association between lack of job opportunities and smoking. Um, and so we can use that instrument to essentially substitute for the potentially confounded 
uh, question of did the patient receive MRI, did the patient receive genomic testing? Um, and so we can think about, um, you know, we use, we actually use instruments very often in all, it's, it's in, in all, in a, most of our studies, you know, the best instrument, actually the ideal instrument is randomization. With randomization, you know, we are, we, we are using, we are flipping that coin. Um, and what that's doing is we're, we're relying on that as our instrument to uh, reduce confounding or, or eliminate it by, um, by creating two different balanced, you know, completely balanced arms. And this is one of the classic studies um, that, that looked at this approach, um, looking at regional rates of cardiac catheterization um, and their association with mortality. Um, and um, so what we, we use, we looked for a suitable instrument in our data set um, and, you know, and, and ultimately found that college education level um, actually did meet the criteria for being an instru uh, for a, a valid instrument. Um, we also looked at income level. Um, although income was correlated with a change in the use of genomic testing, it was a weak instrument because it was uh, also um, highly correlated with the decision um, to both order genomic testing and have uh, and receive actor surveillance. Um, and um, and these, these tests basically confirm those findings that increases in an HRR's use of genomic testing um, was not associated with change in the rate of observation for, pro for prostate cancer, but that increases in uh, use of MRI were associated with increased use of observation. So the take home points here are really that regional level adoption of MRI was independently associated with greater change in the rate of observation for prostate cancer but there was no independent association found for genomic testing. Um, the results from our inter instrumental variable analysis appear to confirm these findings of a, and also serve as a, a sort of a novel uh, method for addressing unmeasured confounding uh, and other biases in observational studies like this. So I think we, we clearly, you know, are just beginning to scratch the surface here. Um, we're still very interested in, in patterns of care among patients in SEER Medicare. Um, and that will give us the ability to look at testing by disease status, grade and stage. And you may be wondering the question about, you know, you know did we account for clinical variables? And that's clearly one of the things we did not do. Um, through a large administrative database like Blue Cross Blue Shield, we have access to claims for services. So we know if a patient had received a certain diagnostic test um, uh, and certain diagnosis codes which are entered, but we do not know their PSA level, we don't know the grade of their cancer, um, which clearly, um, clearly are, are confound these estimates. Um, so your Medicare does offer uh, that information, um, but does lag behind. And so I think we're looking to, to recapitulate these findings um, in the your Medicare population. I think another compelling question is whether or not there is an association between or a link between adopting one technology and a subsequent technology, which may just simply be a temporal relationship. Um, there are regions who are predisposed to sort of being maximalist and using everything, um, and maybe regions that are not. Um, and I think that our HRR level approach will lead nicely to do, to do that. Um, and lastly, I think, to, you know, um, we are going to begin a, what's called a qualitative research study, which will be in-depth focused interviews with patients looking at understanding their experience of uh, being diagnosed with prostate cancer, and more specifically, what their experience and outcome of receiving novel tests are. So the, the experience and, and their experience and their understanding of, of having genomic testing, um, of undergoing a prostate MRI, um, to really get their perspective about what, what, what it's like to, uh, you know, what, what it's like to undergo these, how it addresses measures of uncertainty and anxiety and distress, um, and how it affected their decision-making process. So I'll stop there um, and draw some conclusions. Um, the first really are that prospective cohorts and randomized trials demonstrate the safety and fe feasibility of active surveillance, but raise valid questions about uh, its use and outcome in the real world. Although there has been rapid adoption of both surveillance um, um, and of active surveillance and support the use of these technologies, there's also substantial variation at the regional level. Um, and in our work, we uncovered distinct regional phenotypes of adoption of both prostate MRI and genomic testing, which is novel and I think um, 
um, uh, re requires further study. Um, these ap the, the application of these approaches can also ask questions about the independent utility of new technologies on facilitating active surveillance and appears to um, show a positive association for MRI, um, but, but a null finding for genomic testing. Um, and so I'll stop there. I want to thank um, mentors and collaborators, uh, Carrie Gross, Xiaomei, Preston, and many others. So I'll take any questions. Thank you. At this point, anyone can unmute themselves to ask a question, or you can go ahead and use the chat box. Hey, Dr. Liebman, that was a great talk. Thank you for putting our sort of regional area into perspective. Um, so what do you think? I mean, you mentioned sort of hesitation and, and impact in the real world. How do we kind of standardize that? Protect obviously gives us an insight into what happens when you don't actively follow people on surveillance and you just kind of put them on a no treatment pathway. What, uh, what do you propose for us and sort of globally on how we can implement a more standardized approach? Yeah, I mean, I think really it, it comes down to the question of, of standardization. You know, I, I, you know, it's really shocking to uncover how much, how much variation there is in what happens. And I think we're very lucky. I think the level of care that we deliver in our health network, um, you know, is phenomenal. I, I think, you know, all patients are getting, you know, a very comprehensive evaluation. I don't think it's as simple as saying, okay, every, every hospital in America needs to run out and buy you know, a 3T MRI and, and begin doing these and, and do genomic testing, that will lead to um, a better outcome. But I think probably, I think, you know, the, the guidelines continue to be a bit, a bit vague in terms of, you know, and permissive in, in you know, how patients can be monitored and, and what should be done. So I think standardization, um, you know, phys physicians and, and healthcare practices tend to respond well to, to clear guidance. And I think there's still a lot of room for variation. Um, so, you know, continuing to address this question and looking in real time at, at um, how, how centers are, um, are um, implementing, these implementing these changes and um, sort of, you know, I think, you know, get, getting, a, 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 you know a, getting direct feedback, you know, that doesn't lag behind five years um, would, also be, would also be helpful. Hey, Dr. Liebman. That was a great talk. Thank you. I'm curious, how do you address patients who come to your office and meet all criteria for active surveillance, except they have a Pyrats 5 lesion on MRI? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. I, I, you know, so these questions, you know, so, you know, so if someone has a Pyrats 5 lesion and they, they, they appear to be a surveillance candidate, they clearly get an MRI fusion biopsy. If that shows low-grade cancer, um, you know, those are probably, I do not reflexively get genomic testing on everyone. Um, but that's someone I would get genomic testing on, but I have to tell you that I, there have been zero patients who've had an aberrant, who've had a Pyrex 5 lesion, who I've treated simply because of their, geno their genomic profile is if they've had Gleason 3 plus 3 disease. So I would follow them, but I would follow them more carefully. I'd probably, I would repeat a prostate MRI at one year and another fusion biopsy at one year. Um, you know, their risk for, for develop, you know, for, for, Subsequently identifying high grade disease is certainly higher, but I don't think it's a deal breaker. Michael, and, and, this is Leslie. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Hi. Leslie. So um, I think you've shown, um, which has been the case with other new technologies, that sometimes you can actually increase healthcare disparities and in access to that technology or guidelines or treatment. Um, and I'm wondering whether you think that the variation that, that has been demonstrated by you and others lays more on the provider side or on the patient slash community side? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it probably, you know, my, my hunch is that it lays actually more on the, not a, and I think providers do what they're gonna do regardless of who the patient is. And, um, you know, so, it, and, you know, so if there are, you know, structural barriers raised, or if there's, you know, if someone doesn't have insurance, that's clearly, uh, that clearly is an impediment um, to getting to getting testing, um, but it probably is differences in the pathway that leads to the type of doctor who may order a certain technology. Um, sort of, you know, and and I, I think that's part of it. There's, I mean, it's also it's really complex about who adopts a certain technology and why. Uh, I mean, it's sort of really elegant 
data that, that maps sort of social networks and sort of the effects of peer influence. So if you have a, a physician or a peer in your group who's a rapid adopter, you're far more likely to use it because you're sort of, you hear positive things, you want to be on the cutting edge. Um, and so these things are, you know, we're, we're living in the era of contagiousness, clearly through a pandemic, but the use of these technologies is contagious also within a social network. Um, and so I think that these the racial and socioeconomic disparities probably are barriers to certain to, to patients um, entering a network of physicians who has a higher um, proclivity to use these technologies. Yeah, I, I feel like there's been um, sort of more a attention paid to access to healthcare. And not necessarily, I mean, I know we've looked a little bit on why certain providers um, engage or, or utilize guidelines and which just seem to sort of ignore them. And I just wonder whether there's an opportunity to, I don't know, um, conduct focus groups with providers, you know, especially now that we're using more WebEx and virtual, you could do, um, not you, but I mean, in general, there could be focus groups virtually with providers and um, some kind of intervention where, like you said, you almost have like a, I don't know whether a hospital system does it, but the AUA implements something where there's a champion per hospital or something like that, where they do an intensive learning and then can go back and be sort of the nidus for for spreading that, that information. But I, I don't know, like you said, it's, it, you, to really solve some of these problems, they need a multi-tiered um, attack, if you will. Yeah, and, and actually we are going to be doing that as part, part of the study is, is speaking not only to patients, but also to providers to understand their, um, you know, their experiences and perspectives on, and this is going to be a national study looking at their experiences and perspectives on doing, you know, recommending active surveillance and, not, and sort of, and, and their thoughts about how different technologies may either facilitate or harm that. Um, or, or, or hinder that. Um, you know, we, we're, we've become fairly comfortable with these, but these are still relatively intimidating for, for lots of people, and they actually may miss their mark. And so, um, you know, if you order a genomic test and it shows you a slightly aberrant profile, I think almost everyone on this call would, would, would still feel relatively comfortable watching that patient um, because there's some sort of nuance and experience with understanding that, okay, this is an aberrant profile, or maybe that the, the the decipher score is a little higher than we think, but I'm gonna watch them more carefully. Um, some people may look at that if they don't see many patients, they're not very comfortable and say, all right, I'm gonna treat you right away. Um, and so I, I think no one really knows the, the con you know, we, we assume that every physician has a, a detailed understanding of that, but I, I'm not so sure that's true. Um, and of course, there's the, the, of course, the final question is, is the, the question of incentive and payment, right? So if, you know, if, if people are highly incentivized to, to deliver treatment, um, that's clearly something which is, which is going to continue to be a barrier. Dr. Leitman, in chat, we have a question. Is there any data regarding use of genomic testing and MRI resulting in getting or not getting a biopsy? Um, so it's a good, yes, I think there is some data. Um, that, you know, that first of all, that the use of pre-biopsy MRI is increasing, um, increasing significantly as we would expect. Um, getting an MRI, you know, the problem is it's very, it's very much related to the decision to get a biopsy. It's hard to disentangle the two, but I would say that almost everyone who gets a prostate MRI gets a biopsy afterwards. Um, that's data that we've looked at. And I think Simon Kim also has a publication that, that we collaborated on where he looked at the use of pre-biopsy MRI. So, I think the, the short answer is yes, pretty much if you're getting an MRI before bi you know, before diagnosis of prostate cancer, you are very, very likely to have a biopsy. So, you know, so if there are no, I mean, I'm, I'm curious what, what, you know, people on the calls thoughts are about, you know, about the use of these technologies, you know, um, if these make a difference or this is something we do to confirm um, to confirm a suspicion we have, you know, what is the reason that people do or do not? I, you know, that's something which I've always been curious about. Do we do it because it's there and it, uh, you know, it, it makes us feel better that we use it? I mean, are we interested in a research component of it? Um, it's probably all of the above. Um, so that's sort of one of the, one of the other questions.
since no one's jumping in, I'll, <laughs> I mean. Yeah. Um, I, I just, uh, Dr. Stumbachus, how are you? Uh, great talk. I think the answer to your question is two things. One, there's a group of physicians who will always order a test with the idea, I'm going to order the test, but I'm going to act on it. Otherwise, I'm not going to order the test. So like everything else, if you're going to order the test in my practice, I try to act on it, whether it's watch it on, or do another biopsy or whatever I need to do. So that kind of is one of the fundamental things that I like to do. And, and everything, like everything else, um, two things change physicians' practices, I think. One, guidelines, right? If there are certain guidelines, we as physicians are going to follow them. And it may take a year or two before you start changing your practice to follow. And number two, um, what changes our, uh, changes our behavior, my behavior, is what my colleagues are doing, right? So if I'm here in Greenwich and I'm not ordering an MRI or genomic test and the person up the block is doing it, um, that makes me think, well, maybe I'm missing something and maybe uh, my patient is not getting all the information. So it, at least in my practice, the way I think of it, those are the three things that make me order some of these tests. You know, I'm going to change my management. The other doctor is going to do it. And I'm not going to wait two to three years for the guidelines to tell me what I need to do. That's great. That, that's, that's extremely insightful. Thank you. Yeah. That, that's, uh, I, I think we all feel that way, right? That we don't want to, you know, they're, they're, you know, if something is weird, you know, if something new is coming along, we tend to be, especially if it, we're not talking about a medication or a drug, there's almost no downside. It's just cost. Um, and so I think we tend to be much more accepting of new technologies, which are, you know, sort of giving us new information. I, I was going to say that, you know, I, I, as one of the people who I, I, I believe in MR and I believe in uh, genomic testing, um, I think that we use them, yes, because we have them. But at the same time, I can contrast this with what we have at the VA where we have MR and we don't have genomic testing. Um, and I, I do believe it's a detriment to... Uh, to our patients to not have the availability of that. And, and largely because we are treating some people and, and the, the problem with this is we have no clinical outcomes. So it's kind of based on a hunch and, and based on the preclinical data um, that we are treating people who we otherwise could be following. Um, as I think you mentioned, we don't have any long-term data to know if we're actually providing a clinical benefit to these patients by delaying their treatment if they have low risk disease. Um, although there are some, there is some data from Memorial or some modeling studies from Memorial Sloan Kettering that suggests that the longer someone is on surveillance versus immediate treatment, the better their long-term quality of life. Um, so, you know, kind of using that in, in that context, I think as much as we can safely delay or feel like we're safely delaying patients, uh, Again, the, the data is missing. Um, we are the ones who are at the beginning. I feel like as an academic center, we have the ability to create and analyze that data, and that's sort of our goal. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that's part of our role is to be using this new technology uh, to evaluate its efficacy. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a great point also raising, you know, the experience of when you have it, you, you maybe you, you don't appreciate it as much, but yes, when you're at the VA and you don't have it, you say, gosh, this is, this is really difficult. Um, and so, um, yeah. Dr. Leitman, there's one more uh, question by text. Dr. Honig says, Mike, great talk. Do you have a general protocol for the general urologist for timing of follow-up, for example, MRI, PSA? biopsy, et cetera, every six months or one year? So I, you know, what I, what I do is I do a PSA every six months and MRI at the first year um, and it's sort of partially driven by their, um, you know, by the patient age, comorbidity, you know, in terms of the timing of their first biopsy, but, but all patients, I recommend a surveillance, a confirmatory biopsy within 12 months, usually at the 12 month mark. Um, and if it's favorable, uh, an MRI in one year and the biopsy deferred until the second year. So we actually do have an institutional uh, policy, which if people are curious, I, we can share, um, but it is 
sort of the protocol for surveillance um, as has been on sort of several of our prospective trials is as Dr. Liebman said, a PSA every six months, an MR and biopsy uh, at one year. Um, the protocol is to continue MRI and biopsy annually. We are reevaluating the need for that given more recent data. So that that's being, uh, being reevaluated. Um, but I think at baseline, we should be doing that and MRI alone. So absence of change on an MRI, looking at some of our internal data and recently published data, an MRI alone is not adequate for surveillance. So unless you think the person doesn't need a biopsy anyway at one year because they're in a very low risk group and they have a negative, I mean the, the characteristics that suggest someone could avoid a biopsy or they have a negative MRI, they have a low PSA density, um, below 0 0.08 and we're about to submit that study um, or a very low risk on a genomic test. So less than um, 0.45 on one of the genomic tests. So there, there are a few different things. Uh, I'll be happy to kind of share that with people as we move forward or maybe give a similar presentation to kind of review that. Um, but definitely the first biopsy, if someone has not had an MR targeted biopsy, then the first biopsy should likely be uh, with an MR targeted biopsy within about six months if you have concern that they may be higher risk. I think, President, I mean, there's a great opportunity for also for us to look at the sort of empirically what's going on, right, in terms of, you know, and I don't know if we know, you know, we know the people who are prospectively enrolled in study, but, um, their patients who are managed outside of MRI fusion biopsy. And it's, you know, it's interesting to see the probably the variation that even occurs within our, our health network. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, um, that's one of the, one of the things that's been curbsided by Corona, but we're actually trying to pull all the retrospective data on everyone who's had an MRI. Cause I know there are many people out there who've had an MRI, but then we're not sent for biopsy. So we're trying okay. to, uh, identify and be able to track what has happened with those patients. Great. And uh, I guess Cassandra, always our wonderful champion of the VA, prompted, you know, at, at the VA, uh, we have over 85% of our patients with low-grade cancer um, are followed with active surveillance. So we do have that data on a, about a one-year delay um, in our cancer committee meetings. So, you know, the penetration is high in some of the places that are, are actively managed then not just in the community. That's great, well thank you everyone, thanks for your time.